technology. And uh, I will let uh, Ankara to make a short introduction about this topic. And uh, Anka, you can proceed. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Professor. So as my colleague has stated, during today's event, we will be talking about molecular markers in the context of malignant brain tumors. As we know, diffuse gliomas are the most malignant and aggressive form of brain tumors and account for the majority of brain cancer-related deaths. In order to provide proper care following these tumors, we need to have an in-depth understanding of their biology and behavior. It is important to understand that tumors, which are histopathologically similar, but display heterogeneity at the molecular level, are in fact different entities, will behave in different ways, and therefore will require different approaches. Ever since the publication of the WHO 2016 guidelines, there has been a definite shift in the way that brain tumors are classified, with molecular biology now being an integral part of the decision-making process. Tonight, I'm honored to introduce Professor Dr. Jor Christian Ton, who will provide us with a much better understanding of these issues. Professor Ton is chairman at the Department of Neurosurgery at Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich, while also being an acclaimed neurosurgeon with 30 years of experience in the field. He specializes in clinical and experimental neuro-oncology and is a founding member of the European Association of Neuro-Oncology. Thank you for accepting our invitation, Professor, and we are all looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Anka. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. It's a pleasure and honor to be your lecturer tonight, and I'm very happy to have you here on board, even in the virtual world, uh, discussing with you molecular markers in neurosurgical oncology. And I think in the next couple of minutes, we should listen and then discuss what neurosurgeons really need to know about these issues. And I think in the future, we will more and more develop to um, uh, molecular neurosurgeons, molecular surgical neuro-oncologists. So these are my disclosures. None of them is really di directly related to this presentation. And in the upcoming minutes, I would like to focus on glioma, on pediatric tumors, and also on meningioma. So if we come to glioma, you already mentioned the WHO classification, the revised version of 2016. And um, actually a three layer integrated diagnosis was introduced into this um, revised version, which means three layers, it's immunohistochemistry, it's molecular testing, and then to perform an integrated diagnosis, which means combine immunohistochemistry and the molecular world. And from this on, we learned that IDH1 mutation and co-deletion 1P19Q are important issues, important um, uh, markers to distinguish completely different biological tumors. And these tumors are not only biologically different, they have complete different clinical pattern. So this has been published in Lancet Oncology 2017. It's from the EANO guidelines on treatment of gliomas. But meanwhile, the world has even changed. So this is a list in a very recent paper, end of 2019 in neuro-oncology, listing all the molecular testing, which is now considered to be important for the accurate diagnosis and subclassification of brain tumors. And as you can see here, there's a huge variety of different uh, mutations, methylation markers, amplifications in the glioma, but also in the embryonal tumor, which are predominantly pediatric tumors. And even in other tumors, which it did not have in the focus in the past, like craniopharyngioma and else meningioma, there are already known molecular markers which really make a difference. So when it comes to how to interpret these markers, for instance, in the world of glioma and glioneuronal tumors, you see that there is a variety of tumors which completely segregate these different entities. And in the upcoming slides, you will see 
work from a yet unpublished work, which is the new revised version of the EA and EANO guideline, which will appear in Nature Reviews of Clinical Oncology in the upcoming weeks. And here you can see that the picture which I showed you initially from the 2017 paper is even more complicated. So if we now focus on diffuse astrocytic or oligodendroglial uh, tumors, you see that the first issue again is IDH1 mutation. So distinguish whether IDH mutant or non-mutant tumor. And this can also be done with a very specific antibody, as you know. So each and every neuropathological lab is now in the virtue of doing this diagnostic step. So if you then see the next level after IDH1, which is the primary distinct uh, segregation level, is RTR, ATRX um, nuclear retainment, yes or no. So whether nuclear ATRX is retained or lost, and then it comes to the co-deletion. So when we now look, for instance, into this column, you see that IDH1 mutant tumors with a co-deletion 1P19Q are all oligodendroglioma tumors. And there is no longer any mixture of S oligoastrocytic tumor because you can separate them completely by this co-deletion feature. And this co-deletion feature is only present when you have an IDH mutant tumor. So there's no need to test for co-deletion if you have an IDH wild-type tumor. And this makes this stepwise diagnostic useful because first of all, it's an easy check, IDH mutant, yes or no. And if the tumor is mutant, then you may look into the co-deletion issue because we know by now that oligodendrogliomas are a complete different entity from all other glial tumors. If 1P19Q is intact, then we are talking about astrocytoma, astrocytoma. And as you can see here in the upcoming next version of the WHO classification, there will be again the astrocytoma IDH mutant WHO grade four. Why? Because we will in the future separate the glioblastoma-like lesions from the other glial tumor. So whenever a tumor is IDH mutant, he will fall into this category of either oligo or astrocytic tumor. But there are some with a very grim prognosis. And these are the tumors which have a deletion, homozygous deletion of CDK, M, 2A, or B. These are the grade four astrocytomas. Those who have the CDK and 2AB retained are the grade two or grade three. Is, there, is, we, there is a consortium which we, is we, fun. So there is a consortium working on this, which is uh, called uh, C Impact Now Consortium. Yeah. Yeah. And they have now decided that in the future, most likely. Excuse me, uh, all participants, please turn your microphones off. It's a little bit disturbing to be honest. Yeah. Okay. So in the future, we will have astrocytoma grade two, grade three, and grade four. Now, if we have IDH wild type tumors, it will all end up in glioblastoma. There will be no IDH wild-type astrocytoma in the future, nor will it be an IDH wild-type oligodendroglioma. IDH wild-type will always be considered to be a glioblastoma or a glioblastoma-like lesion. They will be termed glioblastoma, IDH wild-type, WHO grade four. This is the complete denomination in the very future. And then there is a diffuse hemispheric glioma, which has another mutation, which is H3.3. And these two, whether they have distinct clinical differences is yet to be determined. This is a molecular distinguished a distinction, 
but it is not yet clear whether this group completely differs in clinical terms from this majority of the group. And then to end up, there are midline location tumors, so in the brainstem, in the thalamus, most, they're, all of them are white type, and they have the typical H3K27M mutation. And these will be termed diffuse midline gliomas. All of them are WHO grade four, with also a grim prognosis. And this will now materialize also in the recommendations for clinical um, management. So if you see here again, the SIMP positive IDH mutant group and the IDH wild type SIMP negative group, again, as I said, distinguishing co-deleted and intact 1P19Q tumors, and then you can see here in the oligodendroglioma fraction in the future, those who are considered WHO grade two, after surgery, you can do watch and wait. It is yet unclear whether there is a use to do radiotherapy or additional chemotherapy in these tumors. However, whenever they are completely, quotation marks completely excised, you may watch and wait. If you have a grade three oligodendroglioma, you do radiotherapy with PC, PCV chemotherapy. Most of us now do PC chemotherapies, so we omit the vincristine because it does not add any additional value, but it adds considerable toxicity. In the 1P19Q intact tumors, which are termed diffuse astrocytoma, we will then in the future see grade two, grade three, and grade four. Grade two may be similarly treated to the oligodendroglioma, which means once you have resected it completely, you may watch and wait. Whenever it is non-resectable, you should go for radiotherapy plus or minus timosolomide as chemotherapy. The grade threes, all of them need the combination of radio and subsequent temozolomide, and the WHO grade four astrocytomas basically will be treated according to the STUP regimen, which is the concomitant temozolomide and radiotherapy with subsequent cycles of temozolomide chemotherapy. So as you can see, we have grade twos, which are a little bit more liberally in the aftercare. In the grade threes, we have the, the sequential way of radiotherapy plus subsequent chemotherapy. And in the grade four astrocytomas, we have the so-called STUP regimen. In the IDH wild type tumors, in the glioblastomas, we have the distinction on age. Several studies could definitely show that age makes a difference. So patients under 70 years will receive the STUP regimen. And in patients over 70 years, we will now dissect according to the MGMT methylation step. Those who have a methylated tumor, they get the either STUP regimen or temozolomide alone. Those with an unmethylated tumor, they will not benefit from any chemotherapy. They get radiation therapy alone. In the H3 mutant midline tumors, there is still something to be done because we will always recommend stup team in the, in the uh, hemispheric gliomas and in the pure midline gliomas. We will advocate for radiotherapy or combination of radio and chemotherapy. Again, these two entities are rather seldom. No long follow-up in, in larger cohort is yet um, um, available. So we have to learn in the future how to best possible treat these patients. So again, for the treatment decision, you have the IDH mutant, you have the 1P19Q co-deletion. And for instance, if you look in a picture like this, this is a patient with a non-contrast enhancing lesion. This is T2. This is another patient in a non-contrast enhancing lesion. This is T2, this is T1, 
If you now make IDH1 staining, you see this is a um, positive tumor. So this here is a IDH1 mutation. This tumor, which we in the past would have said this may be a low-grade glioma, it's IDH wild type. So this one will be considered IDH mutant diffuse astrocytoma grade two. And this is an IDH wild type glioblastoma, looking quite similar in the MRI, which means don't judge a book by its cover um, and also don't make a glioma diagnosis just by imaging. So imaging will be less important in the pre-classification of the glioma in the future. We will always have to go into more detail. And as I said, also this part here, the MGMT methylation status, makes quite a difference in patients older and also in patients with non-resectable tumors. This has been a series which we did in our department where we looked into non-resectable glioblastoma after radiotherapy and demosolomide. So all of these patients underwent a biopsy. We checked whether it was a methylated or unmethylated glioblastoma. And here you can see the progression-free survival and the overall survival in the two cohorts, the unmethylated and the methylated ones. And you see it's a huge difference so if you have a non-resectable glioblastoma, but with a methylated MGMT promoter, you will benefit from radiochemotherapy according to the EORTC or STUP protocol, which means there is no therapeutic nihilism um, in these patients with unresectable glioblastoma as long as the tumor is methylated. And if you cannot perform a resection, you will always have to say, we should never make a decision about therapy without a molecular marker. So whenever you see the image like this, you should go for some tissue and if resection is not possible or it does not make sense because the patient is very sick or has severe comorbidities, at least do a stereotactic biopsy for histology and molecular signature. In the past, people said, okay, when we do a stereotactic biopsy, we will miss the proper histology. We will not have enough um, tissue for gaining molecular information, but this is not true. From a small biopsy like this in size, you can derive all the molecular markers which you need, like MGMT promoter methylation, codeletion 1P19Q, IDH1 mutation, and um, also the P53 mutational status. The important thing is when you do a stereotactic biopsy, then you should always be sure that you take the biopsy from the solid tumor. So avoid the infiltrative zone from the tumor because there you have only some single cells in between the normal brain. And this may give you the risk of fall negative results. On the other hand, if you have a malignant tumor, avoid the necrotic area because then you get also a non-informative biopsy. So we analyzed in two years uh, in our department over 900 biopsy procedures and the success rate of a molecular genetic analysis was over 98% as long as we stayed in the solid tumor area the morbidity rate was less than 1%, which means that you can do a very um, reliable biopsy with a very low risk even in patients of older age, in patients with some comorbidity. And um, we should always strive for this information whenever we do not a resection anyhow. So another issue was in the past was always, okay, when I do a biopsy, I may miss some of these most important markers because there is a sampling error concerning these molecular markers. However, this is not true. We and other uh, groups could, could demonstrate that all these markers, be it co-deletion 1P19Q, IDH1 mutation, and also the MGMT methylation status, is 
homogeneously distributed throughout the solid tumor. Again, as long as you do not take your biopsy out of the infiltrative zone and stay in the solid tumor, this is homogeneously um, distribution of these molecular markers and you will always gain a proper and reliable diagnosis. So in our department, for instance, we do these biopsies as in the similar approach as we do the open resection. All these biopsies go to the neuropathology department. They do all these um, um, analysis here with IDH1Q pure sequencing, MGMT methylation status. In case of IDH mutation, uh, microsatellite analysis for the co-deletion. In case of other tumor entities, like for instance, pilocytic astrocytoma or others, we do ref mutational analysis. And then the histological diagnosis and the molecular diagnosis will be checked for congruency. If it is a congruent result, then it will go to the interdisciplinary tumor board and then will result in patient adaptive therapy. If this is a non congruent um, analysis, then we will re evaluate it and the people from the neuropathology department do another round on this step of analysis. So in the future, the decision tree will be even more complicated. And this is now how we integrate the um, proposal for a treatment combining the molecular marker, the histological analysis, and also the patient's clinical situation. So you see in the very first instance, you have the um, integrated diagnosis as we discussed before. And then we look into the prognostic factors like age, neurological deficit, tumor burden, and else. And then from this, if we have, for instance, here a grade two oligodendroglioma um, or grade three, and we have favorable prognostic factors, we may go for a wait and see strategy after complete resection. In incomplete resected patients, we go for a chemotherapy. And then also the monitoring and the follow-up will follow a certain decision tree. If you go, for instance, in the glioblastoma patient, you see there are those which are younger, have a favorable prognostic factors, they go the full course of radiochemotherapy. And if those patients have an unfavorable prognosis and they are non-methylated, then it goes radiotherapy only. And if they have very unfavorable prognostic factors, KPS below 50, or inability to consent to any treatment, we also may go for palliative care immediately. However, none of these diagnostic procedures should be done without a proper diagnosis. Even for counseling a patient and, and for stepping back from any further therapeutical um, decision make, needs to have the proper diagnosis upfront. Has tumor biology in future impact on surgical strategy? This is something where Many of us will have to do a lot of research in the future because now, as we know that tumor markers are important and how important certain markers are, now we have to re-evaluate our surgical strategy according to these subgroups. So two examples. This is a very nice work from uh, a group looking into grade three gliomas with IDH1 mutation, but no co-deletion. So in other words, these are grade three astrocytomas. They looked into 124 consecutive patients with newly diagnosed grade three astrocytomas. And they found that the longer progression-free and overall survival in gross total resected patients compared to non-gross total resected patients. This is something everybody of us would anticipate to say, okay, when we take tumor out in a gross total way, then they will have a longer overall survival. However, if we now look, compare it with 
Y-type group in patients with the same similar um, histology but IDH Y-type, then you see that gross total resection and non-gross total resection makes no difference at all. However, in the mutated tumors, survival was significantly longer in gross totally resected patients, undefined, which means um, not yet reached, versus 77 months, which means in the pure true astrocytomas, IDH mutated, survival is clearly dependent on the extent of resection, whereas in the non mutated tumors in the wild type, in the glioblastoma-like lesions, there is no real difference. This is another study from the Dutch group, from uh, a Martin van den Benz group, and they looked into the impact of post-operative volume after resection in, in IDH1 mutated astrocytoma patients. And they saw that even very small post-op remnants already significantly affected overall survival. And they came to the conclusion that in IDH1 mutated astrocytoma, even small post-op volumes have a negative impact on overall survival. And they argue that in those patients, if you have a remnant which you could take out in the afterlook, then you should do a second look operation to remove this minor residues because it really makes a difference for the patient. How about tumor biology of the recurrent tumor? So again, if it comes to certain um, important and for important um, uh, genetic um, alterations, which also could be used as therapeutic targets, like for instance, EGFR amplification or EGFR variant three um, mutation. It's a difference whether you have a primary or a recurrent tumor. The EGFR amplification status remains stable in the majority of the tumor. Stable means the same result in the primary and in the uh, recurrent tumor. However, if you look onto EGF are variant 3 mutation, the expression of this variant 3 changes when it comes to a recurrency. So only 50% of the recurrent tumors retained the EGFR variant 3 expression um, compared to the primary tumors. So molecular data obtained in the primary tumor can be used to predict the EGFR amplification status in the recurrent tumor because it remains stable in the majority. However, a repeat biopsy should be considered in trials which focus on the targeting of EGF variant 3 mutations. This has been re-explored by another group, by the German Glioma Network. And again, it was found that EGFR variant 3 expression changed in a considerable sub subset of patients. And now it was um, advocated that repeated biopsy with reassessment of the status is recommended for patients with recurrent glioblastoma, which are undergoing EGFR variant 3 targeting agent. Is this important? Yes, it is. There had been two studies, the Intelin study with the EGFR amplification they relied on the tissue of the first surgery when they treated the recurrent patients. And they were right, as I showed you, this remains to be stable. However, the REACT study, which focuses on the EGF, um, R or EGF receptor variant three, they also relied on the primary tumor tissue and failed because as I showed you, 50% of the tumors changed the expression and the, of these um, variant three. So they should have undergone a re-biopsy. This is now something we have learned from this REACT study. And unfortunately, also the primary study focusing on the HDFR receptor variant three failed. So in other words, in the future, when we have a target in the primary tumor and we target it up front, that is fine. 
However, if we have a recurrent tumor, we need to know whether the target is still present. And to know this, we have either to redo a resection in the recurrent situation, or if resection is not feasible or does not deem um, useful for the patient, at least to do a biopsy to check whether the primary target or the target which we aim at is still present in the recurrent tumor. This is not necessary for IDH1 for two mutation because they remain stable, completely stable in the primary versus in the recurrent tumor. Also, codeletion 1P19Q is maintained completely in the recurrent tumor as it is in the first, in the um, initial tumor. The same is true for MGMT methylation. So you don't have to re-biopsy a tumor just to know whether MGMT is methylated, yes or no. And the same is true for EGFR amplification. But for instance, as I showed you in the EGFR variant 3, you have to do re-biopsies. So now switching gears to the pediatric tumors, the world is still a little bit more complicated also here. We have different tumors, which are the embryonal lineage. So for instance, the HERT and a variety of different medulloblastomas. You see here, there are different medulloblastomas, um, the non-wind signaling pathway, non-sonic hedgehog, which has a certain molecular signature. Then you have those with the sonic hedgehog um, pathway activated. They disintegrate into the P53 wild type and P53 mutant group. And then you have the wind signaling activated pathway. All of these four um, subgroups are nowadays treated differently by the, neuro, by the neuropediatric oncologists. Another story, posterior fossa ependymoma in children. Look here, this is a large cohort of patients being investigated. And it turned out that two markers which can be stained with histology make a large difference. The one is LAMA2 and the one is NEL2. You can stain them very easily. And as you can see, there are two um, larger groups, subgroups in the, um, in the um, cohort of uh, posterior fossa ependymoma. This is the group of the LAMA2 positive, NEL negative tumors. This is the right um, piece of cake here, 32%. And then the NEL2 positive, LAMA negative tumors, which is around about 50% of the cohort. If you now look into the molecular data of these patients, you see there's a segregation. And this has been done in two groups, in the Heidelberg cohort and in the Toronto Center. And you can see the biology is completely similar in these two um, um, sites, which collected a large um, proportion of these tumors. And you can see that these two tumor entities completely separate in terms of molecular data as well as clinical data, as I show you in the few, in the next slide here. If you look here to the NEL negative, LAMA positive, this is the right um, line here, survival probability in terms of time to metastasis, progression-free survival, and overall survival is much worse compared to the NEL positive, LAMA negative tumor. So in other words, if you have a posterior fossa ependymoma with this um, annotation, NEL positive, LAMA negative, you have a very good prognosis in terms of overall survival and a very low likelihood of any metastases to develop. This is contradictory in this um, um, cohort here. So if we now as surgeons say, okay, but I always try to take out the posterior fossa ependymoma completely, then the tumor is out and then I don't have to care about these markers. That is wrong because if you look into the subgroup of the gross totally resected cases, progression-free survival and overall survival, again, is completely different com depending on NEL positive, LAMA negative or vice versa. 
In other words, even if you took out the tumor microsurgically, in quotation marks, complete way, then still the biology makes the difference. And this is the, the um, explanation of some of these cases where we say, okay, I took off, out the tumor, there was non-residual in the post-op um, MRI, and the tumor comes back rather quick. And in others, it does not come back at all or very late, and patients re, um, um, survive very long. It's not only the surgeon's knife, it's the biology which makes the difference. And this is now the consensus of the pediatric neuro-oncology community that in all these different subgroups of intracranial ependymomas, not only posterior fossa, then different subtypes exist with different clinical causes. And each subgroup has a specific consensus to treat. However, the main consensus overall subgroups is that we always have to sample fresh frozen tumor samples and blood samples from each and every patient. This will be mandatory in the future in clinical trials, but I also advocate in each clinical centers to always sample these um, materials in order to gain a lot of biomaterial, which we all can share in large um, um, collaborative studies in order to gain these information. This is also true for an entity of pediatric tumors, which in the past, most of the pediatric oncologists even yelled at us neurosurgeons when we su suggested to do a biopsy, for instance, in this diffuse fontine glioma. They said histology is not necessary because we can make the diagnosis just from the MR and you should not expose the patient to any additional risk. However, then it turned out that the diffuse intrinsic pontine gliomas have different molecular subgroups. And these different molecular subgroups have a different clinical cause and nowadays also get different um, uh, therapy. So the risk of a biopsy of pediatric and adult brainstem lesions is rather low in experienced hands. These are different um, studies um, and the risk of a biopsy alongside the um, longitudinal axis of the brainstem is in experienced hands less than 1%. So you do a frontal burr hole, you go alongside the midline and you go al uh, alongside the longitudinal axis of the brainstem, so never go transverse. And then you can do a very reliable biopsy and nowadays, the pediatric neuro-oncologists, they ask for this information to enter, as they call it, the biological era of therapeutic decision-making. So the last entity I'd like to mention is meningioma. Meningioma always seem to be something which is not in the focus of molecular analysis. Everybody thought meningioma, either you can take it out or something is left in, but it's a more or less indefinite mass. This is obviously not true. Also for meningiomas, you can find a lot of different mutations and different molecular And this has, been, has led to epigenetic and biological subgroups of meningioma, which you can dis desegregate by DNA-based classification. So you do a methylation assay, of the tumor, and then you can separate these tumors in different cohorts. So this is, for instance, a larger cohort from the Heidelberg group, where they did in their discovery cohort the WHO grading, grade one, grade two, grade three, with a clinical cause as we know it. And then they looked into the methylation classes they developed out of their methylation analysis. And they just, they, um, define three different classes. It's a so-called V9, intermediate, and malignant class. And if you now look into the probability of survival according to these methylation classes, even within different uh, grade one and grade two um, cohorts, you see 
that you can separate the good grade one from the bad grade one and the good grade two, the benign grade two from the less benign grade two, which means that you can see even some patients with a grade one intermediate um, meningioma do much worse than a grade two, which is um, in the good class. So in other words, the methylation classifier separates the clinical relevant subgroups of meningioma much better than does the WHO classification. And then another um, marker turned out, which has already been uh, um, very much in, um, um, analyzed in gliomas, it's the third promoter status. So it, in initial studies, it was described that patients with a meningioma with a third promoter mutation have a higher risk of recurrence. This was also found to be intratumoral heterogeneous, so you have to send in larger lumps of the tumor. And the third promoter mutation is in high-grade men meningiomas, um, a um, malignant classification marker. But also in grade two, WHO grade two meningiomas, third promoter mutation makes a difference as it is associated with worse prognosis. Another marker which was found to be important for meningiomas is the loss of histone H3 case 27. You see the same one which we saw in the gliomas. It identifies a subset of meningiomas with increased risk of recurrence. So let's go back to the third promoter mutation because third promoter mutation has now a very good body of evidence that it really matters and third promoter mutation can be analyzed easily in the majority of laboratories. So the question was, does it really make a difference? And for this reason, um, there was a consortium again of different studies and we have the honor to participate here who compiled the data of eight studies um, altogether 618 patients in whom the third mutation status in their meningioma was known and they were allocated to the group either alteration of the third promoter or a wild type, so a non-altered third promoter. So third alteration was found in 4.7% of WHO grade one, 79% of WH grade two, and 15% of WH grade three meningioma. And the median recurrence-free survival was 14 months in all patients with third alteration versus 100 months for all patients in third Y type. So the hazard ratio for a recurrency was more than 3.7 fold higher in patients with a third alteration. How does it look like? If you now look into probability of recurrence-free survival in those patients with the third wild type, this is the brown line, and a third altered promoter, or altered third promoter, this is the blue turquoise line here, you see a huge difference. If you now look into different WHO grades, for instance, you see that recurrence-free survival in WHO grade three tumors with a third wild type is much better than in grade one or two tumors with an altered third promoter. In other words, it's better to have a grade three meningioma with third wild type compared to a grade one meningioma with a third um, promoter mutation. So third alteration is an important biomarker with the, for the significant higher risk of recurrence and death in meningiomas. And the recurrence-free survival in third altered meningiomas grade one and two is worse than in grade three with wild type. And patients with third altered um, um, promoter or the altered third promoter to be managed and surveyed more aggressively. And also we propose that the alteration of third 
should be analyzed and should be implemented as a routine diagnostic in meningiomas and most likely will also be integrated into the next WHO classification. So to sum up all the things we have now seen, molecular marker help to characterize the tumors within the biological and clinical framework. They aid in personalized therapy and they have already entered clinical routine. And we as neurosurgeons have not only to know these classifications, we also can help to gain this information by our daily work and also by our research. It will be more important in the future and it will fertilize the clinical and basic research as well as translational neuro-oncology. And I would really encourage all young people going into the field and specialize in neuro-oncology within the neurosurgical field. So if you're more interested in brain tumors, meningiomas, other tumors, that you participate in this type of clinical study and basic and translational research because you have the tissue at your fingertips and there thus you have the access to all these um, fantastic studies and all to, to this information. And with that, I would like to thank for your attendance and um, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Professor, for your amazing presentation and I think open-minded presentation about the future in neuro-oncology. There are any questions? Um, if I may? Yes, please. Um, in terms of the, um, of the treatment, uh, after we identify these molecular markers, um, I would like to know what are the current markers that are nowadays used as um, treatment targets? So, if the first thing is the question marker to, to distinguish the different biological subgroups, as I showed you, which then go into this what we call standard therapy, either radiation or chemo or combination. But now we are looking on different markers like the EGFR amplification, stuff like that. And there are now the first markers coming up again because we have to, to check, and in the past we did a lot of mistakes. Usually what we did is that we identified a marker in the tissue. We said this is a good candidate for targeted therapy. And then we started with a phase two trial in those patients who had been heavily pre-treated, second recurrency of the tumor. And then we put him into a study with patient and ne never knowing whether this marker was still pertinent in the tissue. So this is why many of the studies may have failed because the marker we found in the initial tumor was no longer present in the recurrent tumor. So now EGFR again gets a revival. So there will be some more studies going into EGFR receptor by now. There are now studies going into an immune therapy based on IDH1 mutation. So there will be a study um, being conducted in, in Europe um, where patients with an IDH1 mutant tumor get an additional vaccination. Thank you. I have a question. So in the future, if we have um, glioma with uh, EGFR uh, stable, we can do a partial resection and then made a, make a therapy anti-EGFR? Uh, yeah. Well, that sounds amazing. That, that is something which now, what we have to do then is to make sure that this target really gets into the tissue. And then now we come back, for instance, if you look into another entity, which is now different from our um, um, approach here, for instance, if you go for immune therapy, there is a new approach to use CAR T cells. CAR T cells are cells, T cells from the patients, which are engineered with an antigen against the tumor, okay? And then in the D cells, they are used, for instance, in leukemia today, very um, um, successful. 
but they will most likely not enter the brain. If you have a CAR T cell, which is um, um, made against an antigen of the brain tumor, it, the CAR T cell, if you inject it IV, it will not go to the brain. So in the future, we will have to inject these cells directly into the vicinity of the tumor. So again, the neurosurgeons come into play to deliver this type of therapy. And this is also then important to be aware of what happens there and to know and speak the language of the immunologists who will prepare these cells for us. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Uh, I also have uh, maybe two questions. Um, the first one would be regarding the therapeutic tar targets or the metabolic switches. Uh, so, uh, as far as I know, there are a lot of treatments um, targeting, as you have also said, the EGFR or the VEGF. But I was wondering if um, certain therapies that would target uh, metabolic pathways that would be lower, uh, like the ROS uh, yeah. activity, or uh, like for a more general uh, metabolic pathway, w would they be more um, effective in treating um, these types of cancers? Um, actually, yes, there had been lots of, of already uh, preclinical studies, for instance, targeting ras raf pathway, as you mentioned it. These are usually the so-called small molecules. These are molecules which either um, bind to surface receptors of the cell or they are internalized and then they bind to subcellular structures like, for instance, the ras raf um, proteins. However, the main issue is to get them to the brain tumor. So most of these small molecules do not enter or cross the blood-brain barrier. So I think there will be now also a revival of thinking about more local therapies, for instance, by convection-enhanced delivery, which means you inject and infuse very slowly these substances into the brain tumor or into its vicinity um, in order to get it there where it should act. So you're completely right. There are a lot of pathways already described in other cancer types where small molecules are available against these tumors and are effective but they're not effective in brain tumors due to the blood-brain barrier issue. So now it comes to the, back to the local therapy. And uh, if there are, because there are many issues with uh, bypassing the blood-brain barrier, with uh, creating, like I know, for example, the treatment of uh, craniopharyngioma, sometimes the reservoir is used on the vertex yeah. So that the chemotherapy is delivered constantly to the site of the tumor. Would that be an option in specific cases where the blood-brain barrier wouldn't be able to be bypassed? Actually, it had been done in, in glioma treatment as well. If you resect the tumor and then you have a resection cavity and you place your Omaya reservoir into the resection cavity, but then you have usually a very large resection cavity or larger, a couple of centimeters in diameter, and then you dilute your stuff a lot. In the craniopharyngiomas, what people do is in cystic craniopharyngiomas, you put the tip of the catheter into the cyst, you irrigate the cyst, and then you install bleomycin, which is a um, very potent um, um, chemotherapeutic agent in order to dry out the cyst. But these cysts are small and it's a very aggressive treatment for that cyst just to make it shrink and collapse. But the craniopharyngioma is not so highly proliferative, especially the cystic one, compared to a glioblastoma. And most of these molecules which you install into the cavity of the tumor, they will dilute if you have only one catheter. If you put one catheter into the adjacent tumor, adjacent brain around the tumor cavity, then one catheter is not enough because the, the um, molecules travel only a couple of millimeters. So you need lots of catheters 
And that makes it so difficult. And that is the reason why people invented this type of um, convection enhanced delivery, which means you put the catheter into the tissue and you do a very, very slow infusion. It's only a couple of milliliter per day. And this goes into the uh, paracellular fluid space and there is a constant flow of fluid around the cells and the molecules will be transported with the flow and distribute widely into the tissue. Okay, thank you. Uh, are welcome. there any other questions? I have a question. Go ahead. Are, are there any chances to correct the third premotor by Cas9 technology? Um, that, that's a little bit future or futuristic. Um, in essence, you can imagine to do so. Again, you have to precisely focus this technology on your tumor tissue, okay? Yes. So if it comes, for instance, the, the, it would be nice to have these um, altered meningiomas, the third promoter altered meningiomas as a target for this type of therapy. But then you have to get the, this CRISPR-Cas technology into this tissue and this is especially problematic in those skull-based remnants or remnants alongside the um, sagittal sinus where most of these remnants sit once you cannot dissect them further on. So I think since radiotherapy is very effective in meningioma remnants, um, it will be much easier and better to identify the patients with the third alteration and then let them undergo rather soon an adjuvant radiotherapy. Understood. Thank you. Uh, I would have uh, one more question uh, because you showed us the um, the molecular markers for the pediatric uh, brain tumors for uh, medulloblastoma, and I was curious if the resection strategy or uh, would differ if we have because uh, you showcased the. NEL positive, LAMA negative uh, yeah. uh, variant and vice versa. Does the resection strategy vary in any way, shape or form depending on these uh, two different uh, genotypes? Actually, this is a very, very good question which we have now addressed in the future. So for medulloblastoma, that was the first entity where different uh, molecular subgroups were identified and were transported transformed into the clinical practice. So yes, in medulloblastoma, uh, the therapy depends on this molecular signature. So for instance, if you have the sonic hedgehog um, and desmoplastic ones, and you have some remnant, which you have unintentionally left behind in surgery, you may go back and do a second look and resect it, because that makes a difference. In the very aggressive type, it does not make a difference, but these more aggressive types, you have to do a radio and chemotherapy, okay? So in the very small infants, which is the aggressive medulloblastoma, you will immediately go for a very aggressive chemotherapy because the, until age of five, you would not um, um, take them into the radiation department because radiation has a profound impact on their cognitive development. Um, so, in other words, yes, even the re-resection matters in the medullos. In the ependymomas and in other tumor entities where this data is rather new with the different subgroups, we now have to realize and re-evaluate the impact of extent of resection and early re-resection for the clinical outcome. So this is now that all these papers and all the textbooks regarding extent of resection will have to be rewritten in the time of molecular signatures because for some signatures, as I showed in the glioma, if you have a wild type glioma, re-resection of a remnant doesn't make a real difference. In the mutated one, it makes a huge difference. Thank you. Welcome. Okay.
Are there any other questions from the participants? I am just checking the chat prompt. We have just a comment uh, about it being a great presentation, yeah. uh, which I definitely agree with. And I think I speak on behalf of everyone. So uh, before, there are any other... uh, before we close, sorry, Kathy, I would like to share you a link to give us a feedback about uh, our job, please feel free to complete it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, if you have any suggestions, we will wait for them. And again, thank you a lot, Professor, for this uh, amazing lecture and for accepting our invitation. Um, it was really good for us to broaden the uh, the mindset behind the oncology neurosurgery and I think especially us medical students uh, going in and starting, you know, the future of uh, neurosurgery, hopefully, it is really important to be, to educate ourselves in this, uh, in this particular matter of um, uh, the molecular side of neurosurgery. And uh, that is why I think this presentation was very, very fruitful and amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And I'm, I'm pretty um, convinced that your generation will open up complete new doors and new avenues in, in looking at tumors and treating tumors. And I think the years to come, which will be your years, um, are more exciting than ever. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Bye. Pleasure. Thank you. Have a good Bye. night. Good, Bye -bye. good evening. Thank you. Wish you all the best. Bye. Uh, mulțumesc tuturor. Have a good night.